And now from a local grass farmer who is a steward of the soil, he's the founder of the Marin Carbon Project, John Wick. Well, this, this is going to be interesting. I have to draw and talk. And I have hard enough time walking and talking. Um, I have some great news, actually, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, we're going to talk about carbon pools. And um, I have a question. Um, and I need to tell you a short story. In 1619, a Flemish chemist put a five pound willow stick, which most of us might know that willow sticks stuck in soil become trees. The scientist put a willow stick in 200 pounds of dry soil and cared for it for five years. After that time, he pulled it out and removed all the soil from the roots and weighed this tree now, and it was 169 pounds. He then weighed the soil just two ounces less than 200 pounds. And he asked, now where did this tree come from? <laughs> so can I see a show of hands who think it came from the soil? That was a good one. <laughs> uh, the sunshine? Well, sunshine was involved. And actually two ounces of the soil were involved. That's the minerals. Water? Some water was involved. But this is the thing that I just found out a few weeks ago. And I'm actually, um, it's kind of blew me away. Photosynthesis is the process of fixing molecules of CO2 from the atmosphere as solid matter in the form of trees. So here's this several hundred year old discovery of this process of taking this problem that we have now, which is CO2, and using it beneficially in the form of biomass, trees, grasses, and things like that. I thought this was fantastic. So let's look at grass. Grass is, um, this is going to be really hard, sorry about that. But basically grass is this little mechanism of taking atmospheric CO2 and getting it into the soil in the form of carbon. So this is a very abbreviated drawing here, but um, these are the components here. This is the leaves of grass, this is the sunshine, these are the roots, and this is the soil here. CO2 in the atmosphere becomes fixed as um, carbohydrates, combining some of the moisture from the soil and the carbon dioxide in the plant through tiny holes, the molecules of carbon dioxide come through stomata and through photosynthesis bond with some of the hydrogen from the moisture in the soil, creating carbohydrates, which are sugars. So basically, what we're talking about is sugar, and this, my wife Peggy really gets excited about that. <laughs> sugar is basically made up of carbon, and there are three pathways for this carbon that was in the atmosphere to end up beneficially in the soil through the process of the life cycle of the grass. One of them is that the roots themselves are, are sugar or carbohydrates. And in the natural cycle of grasslands, there was grazing. And as the animals grazed the top of the grass, the plants developed, developed a strategy to shed roots. This material in the soil then was broken down into the soil um, by microorganisms, and it ended up being carbon in the soil. Another pathway is that the roots have mycorrhizal fungi on the surface of them, which extends the ability of the roots and it enables the roots to get minerals from the soil that they otherwise wouldn't get. Plants produce 30 to 80% more sugar than they need and they use it in exchange for minerals with the help of mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi are carbon, the um, sugar it uses to get the minerals are, are carbon, and this is a, a second pathway that carbon ends up beneficially in the soil. And the third way is that the leaves that die off land on the soil and earthworms and other macro fauna pull it down and break it down finer and finer and finer and in the end you end up with carbon in the soil. There is no downside to carbon rich soil. 56% of California is grasslands and we, we know it's very well established that the soil on earth can easily hold the excess CO2 that's in the atmosphere. And what we're exploring is on, or what we're exploring now with the Marine Carbon Project is how to enhance that natural process and identify the constraints. 
compaction of the soil through different management practices stops the roots from going deep. So we have a, a compaction issue. How we're grazing these lands also affects the root shedding and the amount of material landing on the soil. And then other practices that cause erosion and, and uh, reduction of the litter on the soil also are um, constraints on that natural process. So we're having great results. And we were able to establish on two plots in California that we were able to sequester 14.8 metric tons per hectare. And um, the calculation is that if you increased your carbon in your soil five metric tons per hectare, it would fully offset all of California's transportation footprint plus a good portion of the building and industrial footprint. So we're doing three times that. We can actually fully offset all of California's emissions by adding compost, that's the first practice, on 50% or 50 of California rangeland. So there, we can go to marinecarbonproject.org and look at uh, the research we're doing there. But what I wanted to talk to you was about carbon pools and why this all makes sense and how it's happening here. So, I'm not even sure how to do this. Any questions on this? <laughs> okay, uh, well, uh, let me answer that one first. Well, I will explain that in a second when we talk about carbon pools. We definitely have to change our fuel use and stop emissions. But this process might give us some, some time to make that transition less painful. How much from like five years, right? I'm not sure of that yet, actually. Five years. Five years, okay. <laughs> you had a question? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, one of the constraints, and I'm sorry I erased that, but Perennial grasses have roots that can go down three feet, six feet, nine feet, even 40 feet is how deep the alfalfa roots in the Great Plains were. So that plant structure can get carbon at depth. And the annual grasses, like the oats that cover California, only need two inches of topsoil to thrive in. So they're not getting carbon at depth. And when it's near the surface like that, it can volatilize and go back up into the atmosphere. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, yeah, um, if I can summarize, your, your point is that there's a legacy load that we're responsible for, and then this process of sequestration can offset emissions and hopefully take down some of the legacy load as well. Is that summarized? I, I would forget about using this to offset emissions. Okay, there we have it. We're going to pull down the legacy load. All in favor? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I need to talk to you about carbon pools to put this in context. There are basically um, three carbon pools on Earth. There's the atmospheric one. And then there's the uh, terrestrial, which includes the ocean, biomass, living creatures, and then there's the lithosphere. Now, oil and coal come up out of the lithosphere, and ordinarily never would have been involved in a healthy carbon cycle, and in fact weren't until 16 something or other, and then 1869 when they drank, sank the first oil well. You look pained, are you okay? <laughs> All right. So, um, well, I'm not sure where to go with this. Basically, we have a healthy carbon cycle. Last time we had it was in the 1600s, and agricultural practices have put a third of our legacy load in the atmosphere, and then we started burning coal and fossil fuels and things like that. And um, one third of Earth's surface is rangeland, and, and our research shows or suggests that we can manage that land differently and sequester our legacy load. Thank you.